Welcome, welcome to the session of the governance of new geographies. I hope you are all in the right room. Welcome very much. And as a cross-border commuter, it is my special pleasure to um, discuss with you, to kick off the thematic action plan on the governance of new geographies. For the next one and a half hour, we will exchange on the related policy challenges that European regions are facing to possible scientific contributions, ultimately the contribution of ESPON. I'm looking forward to the contributions of our online panel. It's made up of policymakers and scientists, of our ESPON expert, and of you, your contributions, because you are hardly invited to share your ideas, your comments, your questions on the Zoom chat. Um, we will right away start with more detailed information on the thematic action plan and related questions. And for this, I would like to invite our ESPON ETTC expert, Sintes Hermansson, he will also conclude our discussions at the end of the workshop. So, Sintis, the floor is yours. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, kickoff uh, workshop on governance and of new uh, geographies. And um, at the beginning, I want to mention that uh, this is not the content of the thematic action plan, by no means. You're all invited to really express your ideas uh, uh, of what that actually could be. And uh, also, the name of, the, of, of this TAP could easily have been uh, Governance and uh, New Geographies. I think this tells a bit where we want to go with uh, this TAP, meaning that we want to talk about the government mechanisms and perhaps not so much about the concept of governance, like good governance uh, or, or, or related things. Um, uh, the ambition is to develop a knowledge base on emerging uh, new geographies in terms of their uh, delineations, uh, functional uh, and cooperation arrangements, and involved actors and stakeholders. And the proposed focus, um, and this is the kind of a first big clarification from, from, from our side, is twofold. Um, we would like to focus on functional territories of different kinds and on territories facing challenges uh, um, or decline. And, uh, that is why in the input paper uh, we mention uh, different types of functional territories, like functional cross-border areas, functional rural areas, uh, labor market areas, uh, and different other uh, functional territories. We would also like to um, find appropriate governance mechanisms which could be introduced uh, or further uh, elaborated uh, to manage these kinds of territories. And uh, by doing uh, all this, we would like to strengthen capacities and skills of the policymakers in order to um, really harness the potential uh, of functional uh, approach in planning and uh, governance. Uh, a bit of the policy context, uh, this TIP theme um, is related to all five cohesion policy uh, objectives of 2021-2027. Uh, it connects more strongly uh, perhaps with uh, Europe closer to citizens objective. Um, uh, by strengthening uh, the integrated territorial development approach uh, via investments in uh, integrated territorial investments and uh, community-led development. Um, this theme also correlates with the Territorial Agenda 2030. Um, it addresses the Just Europe uh, objective and especially concerning um, the subtopic of uh, functional regions by contributing to um, a better balanced territorial development um, and uh, we are local initiatives. And um, this TIP also is related to the new uh, Leipzig chapter concerning the functional urban areas and also to um, European Green Deal's just transition mechanism by addressing uh, marginalization of uh, those territories uh, that are most affected by transition uh, given their dependence on uh, fossil fuels. Uh, now I speak about, uh, a bit about the challenges, uh, drivers and, and trends in relation to this TAP team. And um, if you look at the challenges, um, then uh, firstly, um, 
defining functional territories in terms of their geographic uh, boundaries uh, is not an easy task. Uh, if you have followed recent developments, you have perhaps noticed uh, that there's a drive to establish uh, different types of uh, typologies at the European level. I mean, Eurostat and OECD have worked uh, a lot on this, preparing manuals and guidelines. However, uh, functional territories are dynamic systems, and we need to make sure that any formal uh, statistical denominations are in line with uh, political realities. And this is um, not some pure technical work, perhaps that some would imagine. This is important work uh, because uh, it would allow us to see who is involved and uh, how the functional uh, kind of linkages uh, work. Um, then also in terms of challenges, um, there's a need to define appropriate and inclusive government's models which respect functional approach and are working in practice. In this sense, there is a challenge to highlight the cooperation benefits to all involved actors, um, given also, in fact, uh, the potential issues with uh, democ demogra democratic de legitimacy of such areas. And I think the Urban Agenda Partnership on uh, Sustainable Land Use and uh, Nature-Based Solutions had showcased it, uh, that it's, it's possible to, to show these benefits. And uh, perhaps you have even watched uh, their video they prepared on this. And then also um, another challenge is how to unlock potential of places uh, in decline or uh, discontent. Um, and, um, and then the question really is, can functional approach uh, in planning be of any uh, help in, uh, in this regard? Uh, then next about the drivers. Um, so what are drivers uh, which emphasize the importance of functional areas and governance uh, of them? Um, one of them is the rescaling of planning uh, competences to functional planning regions to address uh, the reality of, uh, of uh, uh, to address the reality of en en environmental, commuting, economic, and other flows across uh, borders. And new uh, territorial governance arrangements uh, are being established for such uh, regions. Then um, we can see also increasing uh, voluntary and soft cooperation for the provision of services and uh, resolving planning challenges. And territories uh, sometimes uh, form together sort of communities of intent. And uh, these uh, communities are not even glued together by, by functional linkages. Um, and then, uh, obviously also, uh, the, the impact of, uh, of the COVID uh, and uh, the way people work uh, and commute is, uh, is having an impact and uh, that might also change the functional uh, linkages. Now the next about the trends, which are very much related um, uh, with the challenges and drivers I mentioned before. Uh, one of the trends is that understanding of different uh, functional geographies has grown by introduction of uh, improved and, and large list of uh, typologies. For instance, recently adopted the tertiary typology at the European level, uh, and also the methods used to analyze and distinguish between different types of uh, typologies. In terms of development trends, uh, there is a set of territories which have experienced significant demographic and economic decline. Uh, this phenomenon also concerns cities and their functional areas. We, we, we now talk about shrinking cities. Um, and in addition, a whole new debate has started in Europe concerning geographies um, of this discontent, meaning people are voting um, um, in, in, in a way to protest against development trends. Um, and then introduction or further expansion of uh, working schemes uh, due to COVID pandemic will mean that people will not need to commute so often and uh, work from home or work from anywhere uh, uh, are becoming uh, the new reality. So these are shortly the, the trends which kind of uh, influence this uh, thematic action plan. And now if I go further to the possible um, inquiries about the policy needs, then, uh, well, this is just a, let's say, um, a first shot, an example of uh, what could possibly be um, uh, asked. And uh, if I mention some of the examples, then, then one of the policy needs would be how to define functional areas uh, in a way that any definitions correspond to actual policy uh, processes, uh, what kind of uh, data and uh, methodologies are needed for that. Um, 
how functional areas are embedded and integrated in government's uh, practices, what are the benefits of uh, cooperating uh, within functional areas, how such benefits can be showcased uh, to all parties uh, involved. And then uh, who are the main stakeholders and what type of governance mechanisms should be put in place? Uh, what are the tools to achieve effective implementation of different policies in functional areas? And uh, as I mentioned also, how to unlock the potential of places uh, in decline of peripheries, places undergoing uh, marginalization, and how to really make sure such geographies uh, are more connected uh, in the future. Then, uh, in terms of the research support, um, this again is, uh, is an example um, um, of an outline. And here we can mention uh, uh, several things. Uh, what is the stock of available scientific uh, evidence? And here, importantly, going beyond what ESPOM program has accumulated so far. Um, what is the state of the art in research work on governance of functional territories? Does this research have a territorial focus demonstrate wide territorial coverage and is based on uh, solid data and uh, methodologies? Um, are there any distinct evidence gaps on functional territories that ESPOM program would, would, would be suited to fill? And what are the instruments to achieve it and how could complement the work by uh, other research bodies, which is uh, quite important, so we don't have overlaps. Um, then also, what is the current discourse? What are the current discourse questions and debates as aspects that might uh, further pursued by by ESPON? And um, that's it for uh, for my short introduction presentation on on this um, TAP theme. Uh, as also mentioned by Timo, um, you can all join the discussion. We have a website, uh, we have a web page on our website uh, on this TIP. There's also a, a Yammer platform uh, where you can uh, uh, join the debate, post questions, and, um, and most importantly, share your ideas. Because as I said, this is the kickoff uh, of, of this process. These are the first ideas, and uh, of course, we, we look forward to, uh, to your feedback um, and uh, possibly alternative suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sintis, for this comprehensive introduction to the theme and also to the questions. You have listed the possible inquiries. And we, right away, we are coming now to our online panel. And I will give each of the scientists and policymakers um, 10 minutes maximum to share their presentation. And then each of them will have a quick opportunity to respond to the others' interventions, and then we start to discuss this with the audience. So now, first of all, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Nikolaos Karadimitriou from the Bartlett um, School of Planning of the University College London to share his presentation. Mr. Nikolaos, the floor is yours. Yes, we are waiting for Mr. Nikolaos. Are you connected? Does it work? Good vibrations in the air. You should be connected. If not, we can switch also to the next speaker, he is connected. Okay. It should work now. We all know this, we are experienced now a long time with all these technical challenges. Welcome, <laughs> Mr. Kare Dimitriou, welcome. At the moment we cannot hear you. Uh, is the sound on? Is your sound on? Okay. Can you speak again, please?
see people are, would like to see the slides, I could share my screen, but it's supposed to run uh, centrally. Um, so uh, I will continue unless I hear otherwise. Uh, um, the, so it's this ESCON, therefore, uh, is expanding a bit the, the sort of hard uh, functional definition. Uh, of course, it covers uh, functional rural area, uh, sort of hard cooperation areas. Um, into areas where we are talking about uh, flows and networking, or even communities of intent. Um, and uh, based on that, based on this understanding of uh, what new geographies, uh, what new geographies are. Uh, okay, so I will share my screen then. Uh, give me a second, please. I need to start the presentation. Okay, and then yes, and I will share the screen now. Okay, uh, so I hope you can see me now, uh, and I hope you can see the presentation. Um, so the themes that emerged uh, at this stage of uh, the assignment uh, basically are six. Um, the first one is new geographies of practice. The second one is uh, new geographies of transition. The third one is new geographies of newcomers. Uh, fourth, new geographies of speed. Five, new geographies of criminality. And six, new geographies of health and illness. And I will quickly go through them because uh, this is supposed to be just uh, food for thought and uh, really uh, help uh, this session to sort of brainstorm a bit. Um, so new geographies of uh, practice, um, uh, basically we, we see a need to actually have a, a, an online tool or a kind of uh, database that will link all the soft new governance frameworks that emerge out of the various challenges that arise locally or uh, regionally uh, and to be shared. Uh, the second one uh, is a new geographies of transition the, the change in infrastructures and, the new, and their governance. And here we, we spotted uh, quite a few, actually. Uh, we spotted uh, platform capitalism, uh, uh, circular and sharing uh, economies, renewable energy production, food production and distribution, digital infrastructure, and so on. Um, and all these transitions uh, cause, of course, have territorial impacts, and these territorial impacts, of course, uh, also need to be explored further. Some of those areas have been uh, spotted by ESPN beforehand, some of those are new. Um, then, and for the last uh, four, uh, the new geographies of newcomers, I mean, obviously we're all aware of the big issues around refugees and uh, migrants and so on, but also the movement, the population movements in Europe are not only about that, uh, foreign mi migrants, they are about uh, movements of students, movements of uh, uh, intra-EU uh, economic immigration, a movement of pensioners and so on. And of course, all these have territorial implications and create, create uh, enclave, create areas which depend on those flows and so on and so forth. Um, the fourth is new geographies of speed and effectively the impact of uh, high speed travel, uh, both train and uh, by air, uh, across European regions. Uh, I mean, uh, you all are familiar with uh, the Ryanair effect uh, and this result of research as well on. Uh, uh, the impact of high-speed trains in the places in between. So it's really worth looking how uh, this uh, very, very quickly evolving uh, 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 geography, let's say new geography, uh, it has impacts locally and, uh, and uh, maybe new territorial formations around them. The new geography of criminality, and that's uh, something which uh, we couldn't find much uh, work uh, in ESPON or uh, at the European uh, EU le uh, level, uh, effectively how networks of criminality are shaping the European space to their benefit, to create functional or maybe dysfunctional areas. Uh, and of course, how to govern such regions. Uh, it's politically sensitive even to start looking into this perhaps, but uh, uh, it's an important issue and it's worth considering. And uh, last but not least, new geographies of health and illness. And, um, this is not only about COVID itself, but it's also about the responses to COVID.
COVID and the responses to issues of public health and uh, health provision and also the responses to people seeking health care. So new territories forming where uh, the health provision regimes might be uh, of better, worse, attracting people and so on and so forth. And that might have, of course, significant uh, implications in the future, uh, given that uh, Europe is aging. Uh, thank you. And um, I hope you were able to, to see the presentation and to hear me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Karadimitriou, it's very much appreciated that in the short time you gave us a lot of inspiration on themes and despite all technical challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, um, it yes, no, very kind, thanks. Uh, we are coming to our next speaker and I would like to invite now uh, Mrs. Barbara Betzneck. Uh, she is a researcher at the uh, Slovenian Academy of Science and Arts, and she is an expert on migration. And uh, yeah, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so, just a second, please. I think uh, we may have uh, at the moment uh, another order of presentations. So, this is uh, Barbara Betzneck. <laughs> no? Okay. Okay, everything's fine. Sorry. Just go on. Just go on. Thank you. First of all, thanks for the invitation. Uh, thanks uh, to you all for joining. Well, um, I, was, um, I will try to outline some new European geographies uh, and their challenges and also some general ideas and further research and policy proposals what is this? migration it's not right. and mm -hmm. also broader social cohesion. Because uh, like, uh, only a decade ago, it seemed, uh, it seemed as if the EU was a space of expansion, free circulation, integration, whereas today, it seems as if Europe is somehow becoming more and more fragmented, smaller, static, close. And uh, if you want to understand this new European geography, then I think that we must remember that the continent has been through at least three major crises only in the last decade. So uh, the first one was the Okay. Financial crisis. She's only talking. So somewhere She's only talking. She hasn't the presentation. Um, okay. Where citizens bailed out financial markets by means of state imposed austerity measures. And the states cut back on investments in public services, most prominently health, education, culture. Unemployment rose and salaries were. Um, fell or were frozen for significant periods of time. Um, these measures um, reinforced social inequalities that already existed in the societies, but they also caused uh, the outbreak of um, divisions within the EU with the interests of uh, big central economies such as Germany and France, against the interests of the more perifer peripheral, poorer economies such as Greece, Italy, and Spain, for example. And the tensions surrounding the unequal structure of the Eurozone were fully exposed. Nationalist tensions and anti-European sentiments were already on the rise, but they were not yet fully developed. Well, this changed uh, rapidly during the second crisis of the decade, the refugee crisis, which existed before, but was fully exposed uh, in 2015 and 16. So this is where the already existing inequalities between the South and the rest of the EU were being uh, reinforced. Uh, the South of the EU continues to be the most exposed to migration flows, uh, mainly due to geographical reasons, but also due to political regulations such as the Dublin 
attention, while it is still bearing the main responsibility for welcoming and caring of new arrivals, even though um, the southern states were most devastated after the financial crisis. So um, the building of walls and fences, first implemented by Viktor Orban, was initially condemned and ridiculed, but today, like hermetically closed borders and the externalization of migration control are more and more into, integrated into the official EU migration policy. In the Mediterranean, along the Balkan road, in the channel, and along the most recent so-called Eastern European migration route on the Polish and Russian border, uh, the humanitarian approaches reduced to a minimum and completely eradicated. NGOs, humanitarian and solidarity activities are increasingly criminalized. Access to crisis areas for independent monitoring mechanisms with journalists, politicians, scientists, lawyers, you name it, is blocked or restricted, severely restricted. <coughs> so, along the European external borders, Thousands and thousands of people today are stranded without basic infrastructure, without basic services, without access to any legal procedures. EU's external borders are being militarized, new restrictive laws and measures are being applied, and violent and brutal pushbacks are being normalized. Most of them, most often, in blatant violation of the EU law, the international law, and various conventions of human rights. So in addition to this situation, the ongoing corona crisis seems to generalize the state of exemption. There are closures of national borders, restrictions on freedom of movement, curfews, state of emergencies, uh, limited right to social, political, and economic participation. And once again, the countries most affected by the corona crisis are in the south, where austerity measures imposed after the financial crisis have seriously damaged the public health sectors. And while most citizens have at least a roof over their heads, basic sanitation, emergency access to healthcare and social services, many migrants, and especially refugees, are deprived of even those. So, in short, the new European geography is marked by crisis of social cohesion, crisis of political institutions on all levels, crisis of the rule of law, of democratic principles, and crisis of human rights, even the value of human life. European integration has proved to be unprepared to face these challenges, so there is um, decreased trust in European solutions and the rise of nationalist responses, so we are witnessing the an increase of extreme right wing and anti EU parties in national parliaments, but also in the European Parliament. So we have Brexit, and there are other initiatives on further withdrawal from the European Union. There is the suspension of Schengen, the reintroduction of internal border controls. So the cumulative result of these crises is an increased fragmentation of the EU, aggravated division between the South and the North, between the East and the West, between the center and the periphery. So even the basic foundations of the EU, such as the rule of law and the primacy of EU, of EU law are being put into question by some of the member states. So, uh, Although the present forms of European governance have failed in many respects in the face of these challenges, or even produced some of them, <laughs> I still believe that a return to a state of national emergency cannot be the answer to the questions we face today, if we don't even mention the real and present impacts of the climate crisis. In short, in order to imagine and develop new and effective forms of governance, that will include all levels, like local, national, EU, global, as well as a combination of them, which I think is crucial, a combination of all those levels, we will need further research on the impacts uh, 
on the already existing divisions inside of the EU, on social cohesion within countries, on the further divisions between EU and the, and the neighboring regions through militarization of borders and the externalization of migration control, uh, on the impacts on uh, border regions and their communities, cross-border cooperation and circulation, on the impacts of exclusive migration and social policies on various local levels, such as the rise of undocumented people, the numbers of undocumented people in Europe, the lack of employment possibilities <coughs> and the following lack of prospect and hope. Um, the impacts of spatial policies of ghettoization, marginalization and gentrification. And in the end, uh, the main question will be on how to transform and create new institutions and policies that are more inclusive, multidimensional and somehow eclectic in their approaches, so on how these institutions can be more flexible and adaptable to the local context, different local contexts on the one hand, but also how they can be allowed to rely on stable infrastructures and continuous material, as well as political support on the other. Maybe I can discuss... Uh, thank, thank you, Mrs. Presnick. I think I have to cut you short now. <laughs> thank uh, you. Are, are you finished uh, with your yeah, presentation? My last sentence was... Yes. Because, uh, research and policy proposals are not just about the case of Slovenia and discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for... I think you have given us a lot of food for thought. Uh, and uh, a lot of challenges uh, we are facing and where the governance of new geographies uh, actually really plays a role and how, how, to, how to manage and how to work with those challenges. It is now my pleasure to invite our next speaker, who is Dr. Klemen Miklavic. And, um, well, um, he is not only a researcher, he is also the mayor of Nova Gorica in Slovenia. So, um, Mr. Klemen Miklavic, the floor is yours now. Welcome. Uh, thank you, and thank you for inviting me to uh, this panel. I will mainly speak from the best of uh, policymaker rather than researcher. That was my previous life. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, being a mayor takes, uh, uh, takes my uh, full day. Um, but for better understanding, I will also load a uh, presentation. And I would ask you for a quick feedback whether the presentation uh, is successfully loaded. Is it? Yes, we can see it. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, so um, I will talk in concrete terms. So on a, on a case uh, which, which exists and it's uh, in uh, part of Europe, very interesting part of Europe, you see the area is circled in red. Uh, between Slovenia and Italy. Uh, I'm mayor of uh, Nova Gorica, and on the other side of the border is Gorica. The, the area, the border, how we see it today on this uh, simple map, uh, was uh, drawn uh, in 1947. Before that, the border was either more uh, to the east or more to the west, depending on which part of uh, the history uh, we look at this territory. So the World War I was the first event that shifted the border towards east, and then World War II, well, and uh, before that, the, uh, the border was more to the west during the Austro-Hungarian um, times. So if we zoom in now, we are looking at the same uh, region, just a bit closer. Uh, we see that the border goes quite in unnaturally. It was a compromise. Uh, between two uh, blocks, so Soviets wanted it uh, differently uh, to the Americans, and then the French kicked in, the diplomats, and then uh, this was uh, the compromise that was set, and that compromise actually uh, preserved peace, but on the other hand, cut through a region that has always been 
uh, one uh, integral region. So what happened, because Gorizia, you see the border goes around Gorizia, was given to Italy, and uh, the whole region uh, around it was uh, given to Yugoslavia back then. Uh, Yugoslavia decided to build a new city on the eastern side of the Black Line. Black Line is the border here. So, so a part of Gorizia belonged to Yugoslavia, and then it was extended uh, and called Nova Gorizia. So now we are here with a very interesting geographical but also political situation where we have two cities that grow into each other, that uh, intertwined their, um, their uh, uh, daily, um, daily life and uh, the citizens of both, uh, um, yeah, both cities are uh, either working here, living there, or having businesses open here, having relatives over there, and so on. So uh, what, what happened from 1990, when Slovenia got independence and the uh, change of the system occurred, uh, is that uh, this integration was, uh, was uh, speeding up. Uh, the entrance of uh, Slovenia to EU and then the Schengen region uh, were two decisive steps forward in this integration. Today we have a, a, an urban area that wants to become one unique urban area, a cross-border city that is a capital of a cross-border region. So we're trying to sue together what has been there uh, as one region before 1947, uh, and also uh, functionally, uh, uh, geographically and politically, uh, part of one uh, uh, integral uh, geographical notion. Uh, so what happens in uh, reality here, we have a bit uh, more close in uh, uh, into, the, into the urban area. We see that the, the, the streets are shared and uh, the squares are shared. Also the railway um, is uh, built so that it used to be, the northern side used to be uh, the railway station. Uh, so this, today's central railway station of Nova Gorica used to be the northern railway station of Gorica, designed in 1906. Uh, when it was still, everything was still part of the Austro-Hungaric Empire. This is the railway station that uh, reminds us of an Art Nouveau uh, period in uh, European history. Um, and this is the square in front of it. Uh, exactly in the middle of the square, the border uh, crosses uh, um, and uh, that also became a very famous site of our city. We have uh, a quick look, uh, also the Renaissance time and the Baroque time uh, buildings. That's a monastery where the last French Bourbons are uh, buried because they were in exile in the, 19th, in the 19th century. Here is the castle of Gorizia, so uh, the old part, medieval castle. We are looking across to Nova Gorizia. We will also have some pictures. This is a medieval street, a former shopping street of Gorizia. And now we are in Nova Gorizia, a modernistic town. This is the municipality building from where I am now giving this presentation. But we have also a very typical uh, buildings from the 20th century, especially from Eastern Europe. Those who are from there will recognize the architecture. Um, and uh, we are also known for uh, casinos um, um, and also modern, more modern uh, building on this side. So, so we have a mixture of a 70 years old city and a thousand years, it's thousand years since Gorizia was uh, mentioned the first time in the written form. Now, together, uh, we have this challenge in front of us. We want to govern the territory as one. And uh, uh, what uh, is now the border for us if before the border represented an economic opportunity, there was a lot of trade because of the difference between socialist Yugoslavia and uh, Italy. Um, uh, now the border becomes an obstacle. So we're trying to govern the, the territory as one, uh, despite this uh, obstacle and all the challenges that are related uh, to the border. Uh, what helps us a lot is the EGTC. It's uh, one of the several EGTCs across Europe that really came uh, to our help. So it was a tool developed by European Commission that uh, helps us uh, govern this territory. This EGTC has had a lot of projects recently, and this is uh, the map of the two cities and the, the uh, investment that have been made through EGTC on one and the other side of the border. Uh, 
Here are some pictures of, of the projects that, uh, that uh, have been uh, inaugurated. It's mainly the recreation parks, uh, the um, uh, parkings for the, for, the, uh, for the campers. Here is a bridge, a bridge for pedestrians and cyclists that has been built. On the left side is uh, construction and on the right hand side is the built bridge. It's also built with European money by the EGTC. Um, here is the cycling network, so we have a whole network of uh, cycling lanes that has been developed also uh, with, with the money of EGTC. Some of them cross the border, back and forth, back and forth. Um, here is the health uh, uh, investments, so, so we have some common health infrastructure, especially the nursery, but also the mental health institutions that can be used by both uh, citizens. Uh, and one uh, thing that has been developed this year, and we are particularly proud of, it's a tunnel that will serve. So it starts in Nova Gorica, which is higher on higher quota, and it goes through Gorica into the river. So it serves as a flooding prevention uh, system. It wouldn't be, uh, uh, it wouldn't be, it would make sense to make flooding uh, prevention system only in one side of the border. Uh, because uh, the, 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 the water doesn't uh, doesn't care about the border, so it was only effective because it was a cross border. And this particular project tells tell, told us how many obstacles are still there if we want to develop develop and govern this ter territory, which is uh, cut by the border, uh, and uh, how, how much the border is still an obstacle. It was a lot of uh, painstaking. Uh, processes to come to the permissions that uh, eventually led to the building of this tunnel. There is not only one bureaucracy, there were two bureaucracies. It was the local bureaucracy in Italy and the national bureaucracy in Italy and the local bureaucracy in Slovenia and national bureaucracy in Slovenia. And they had to connect each other in order to come to the permissions to build a cross-border tunnel which served the citizens to be safe from the eventual uh, possible floodings. Um, that's why, to conclude, uh, it will be in the future very important for the European Commission and all the authorities in Europe to think of uh, instruments that will make possible the governing of the territories which are cross-border territories and which want to or naturally uh, are predisposed to develop together as one single cross-border region. That's uh, also something that could be a next chapter of the European integration. If the European integration so far went from top down, from, from you know, Brussels with the big projects, with steel, with coal, with atomic energy, with uh, tariffs and so on, that was all top down. This is an example how Europe can work on the ground, on the micro level and affecting the daily life of our citizens. So in the future, Dear Mr. Miklavich, can you please? Yeah. That's my concluding <laughs> remark. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. And I, I was just about to, um, uh, to make you compliments and uh, say that you, the scientist shines through, that you are so well on time. Thank you very much uh, for uh, explaining so well and uh, to everyone this cross-border situation uh, you are facing. And I think it gave a very, very good illustration of this uh, kind of new geography and I also see a lot of potential also of exchange of good practices. We are lo located in Luxembourg and we know very well what you are talking about. So thank you very much for this uh, policy need declaration uh, after we got the scientific inputs already. We are now coming uh, to our last speaker of the panel, which is um, Peter Ostin, who is a planning advisor to the city of Oslo. And he is also sharing his uh, policymaker view with us. Welcome. I think at the moment we have a, a problem. You, can you please unmute? Yes. Could this work any better? Yes. Yes, it's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank uh, you. I'm waiting for the slides to come. Before, before they come up, I'd just like to comment on, on the two, two of the previous presentations. Uh, sorry, sorry, we have a special round on this. After you finish, we have a but round for comments. 
But I'm waiting, I'm waiting for my slides to come up. When they come, I can say what I'm going to say. So I'm commenting first on, on uh, uh, Miklavich's presentation from, uh, from the border between Slovenia. Uh, there we are. Governance of new geographies. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm from the city of Oslo. Uh, we've been working with our neighboring region for many, many years. We have a joint plan at the moment. Uh, and the joint plan is um, under threat because of changing geographies. If I have time, I'll come back to some detailed uh, discussion about that later. I will be presenting this uh, uh, short discussion in the, from a metropolitan perspective towards the cohesion policy goals. Next slide, please. Uh, the spatial scales in metropolitan areas are, are complicated uh, the city core is in the middle we have the urban fabric which is the the, the built-up area which often covers many other municipalities as well and the wider housing and labor market area uh, surrounding that which often goes out into what we call the countryside and beyond that often the economic region which would normally include the national airport or a, a national harbor or something like that uh, next slide please uh, this uh, is, is, is done to, to show indicatively how, how the spatial geography does not usually fit the administrative borders anymore. The cities are usually uh, grown way beyond their original urban core, covering many municipalities. The uh, functional urban, urban area does not necessarily fit closely to the municipal boundaries or the provincial or regional boundaries, which is the red line on the right. And right out on the other side, we've got the national boundaries, which, of course, uh, means something quite different again, which we've just heard about uh, several times. I'd also point out that the city core is often divided into city districts. Now, why is this important? It's important because these are the levels at which decisions are made. These are the levels at which budgets are organized and managed and directed through legislation. And these are the levels at which data is collected. Uh, the last point is very important for us uh, in the context of SBON. Thank you. Next one, please. Functional urban areas, uh, this is a complex but essential challenge. Uh, there seems to be a lot of new engagement in functional areas from the work that's been produced and presented uh, so far. There's the CMAT reports, which have been reported on. OECD is continually working on new de delineations. And I'm aware that the uh, Eurostat uh, network is, is produced, the Eurostat office is producing what they call terset uh, typologies. This can be defined in many different ways, but the main point is that we need to see what are the drives of change. There's growth and decline in the pandemic, which have been referred to. Uh, and then the need, what we need to do with the functional urban areas to support better policy delivery at strategic scales. This is the main question I think we're looking for. Uh, well, however we define the geographies. Uh, we need to sust encourage sustainable growth and address this question of geographies of discontent, which I think is a very important concept. Uh, I think that can be described in a number of ways. And the functional urban areas very often counterbalance what I would say are the strong power bases of discontent, which are exploited among a number of countries which have been referred to so far in this discussion. I wouldn't need to mention them. Uh, we also need to add, learn how to understand and plan with post-COVID post dynamics. There, there are a lot of changes happening in terms of migration in term, within the functional areas and within uh, about, uh, transport. On the right-hand side, there's a number of issues uh, there. I would like to point out one, one issue here is the proxy definitions. Uh, there was a question early on about whether we need to define uh, functional urban areas. Espon seems to often land on what they call the travel time and sort of chronographs. Uh, the OECD has used commuting rates, which seems to make more sense to us because these closely relate in people's minds to the policies. If a lot of people are traveling into the city, then it makes more sense to develop in a certain way and encourage the public transport. If the time to travel is short, it doesn't really matter if not many people are, are, are traveling in that direction. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, there are three main networks which Oslo takes part on together with a number of my colleagues, some taking part in this uh, discussion today. Uh, Eurocities is, is the main one. Then we've got Metrex, which uh, represents the city regions. And, and we have the European Metropolitan Authorities, which is a, a policy-oriented body. I think I, it's fair to say that all these three networks, which represent uh, well over half of Europe's population, really, uh, they they are calling to recognize the reality. There are shared functions and identities uh, within each metropolitan area. 
it's very important to work at an effective scale because these challenges are too big for cities or municipalities to resolve on their own. Uh, and we need to work to share the capacities, again, because often municipalities are, are rather small surrounding the cities, and if we work together, we can, we can do a lot more. And we need an innov innovative and appropriate form of governance. What, it, what fits in one city does not necessarily fit in another uh, metropolitan area, so this has to be thought out carefully and is, is place-dependent. Next slide, please. Uh, there are a lot of examples from cities and, and regions across Europe. I've listed them up here. I hope this slide will be shared. Uh, we, we, we don't need to go through all the details. Barcelona, uh, area metropolitan Barcelona, the picture on the right is from a, a town outside Barcelona, which is uh, probably one of the strongest examples in Europe we have of a well-organized, legally frameworked and very strong political body dealing with it at this level. The ITI agreements are, are becoming more familiar now. The Czech Republic and Poland achieved a lot in the previous period. The Czech Republic is now expanding, as I understand, the number of cities which will be doing this. The French model and the Italian model, both legally tied uh, with a, a very strong uh, directive in a sense, but at the same time they're often struggling. Uh, we can see even, even within the legal framework, they, they, uh, they, they often have a lot of challenges in making this work. I think we'll move on to the next slide now, just to, to, to wind this up. Thank you. So the current challenges and research needs. On the right-hand side is a, a strategic regional plan for, for Stockholm, our, our twin city on the other side of Scandinavia, which is very much a model for what we're doing. They've had, they've had a, a strong legal framework that has been operating for the last 50 years uh, to do this, and, and it seems to be working very well through uh, both persuasion and uh, controlling a lot of the, uh, the, 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 the mechanisms they need for investment. Uh, we need to tie what we're doing very closely to supporting EU policies, cohesion policy, the new Leipzig Charter and the territorial agenda. That, for us, is the sort of foundation, I think, in, in the way this should be developed. Uh, we need to include uh, functional urban areas in the urban agenda partnerships and in the rural pact, which is at the, in the process of being developed at the moment. This was not achieved very well in the previous period. Uh, and our view is that the Leipzig Charter is strengthening this. We need to improve the access and the use of functional area data across and within boundaries. And in this context, we're talking especially about uh, splitting up the data within the cities. Treating a city as, as one single data unit really doesn't make sense. And I think if Esbon is going to uh, do an important uh, piece of work here, it really is about looking at, uh, at local area data within cities to understand more what is happening. Referring to the very important presentation from Barbara just now, I think the whole question of refugees, minority groups, integrating them into the, our societies, this is very, very dependent on local data from within cities. Rural urban dynamics and interface is a very key, important issue. Str strategies to challenge yes. urban sprawl. And then the last one you can see, they build on experiences and networks that we have. Uh, there's a lot of experience to build on. The list of cities and countries that I showed in the previous slide is there, and we have these networks that are ready and waiting to, to do work. We've already been lucky in Oslo and taken part in, in two Espon projects. Uh, I know there's a third one being floated in parallel. Uh, we're talking about SPIMA, we're talking about MISTA, and we're talking about Metro, which have all been formed within the existing networks, uh, especially Eurocities, but also Metrics. Uh, and I think this is, this is the way to go. Use the networks and... and, uh, and uh, build on that and the experience that's there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Austin, for your efficiency and, uh, of course, for all your practical uh, information uh, that, is, that is very helpful to design the future thematic action plan. Um, I would like now, as thank you very much, you were already uh, ready to comment uh, on the previous speakers. I would like to invite you to do this and we will go the reverse order. We had the speakers uh, to give uh, two minutes, uh, if possible, comments, remarks on the other one's speeches. So please uh, give, it a, give it a run, Mr. Austin. Okay. Uh well, very interesting, uh, Miklavic, uh, Klemen, Klemen Miklavic, to hear about uh, Novgorica. I, I was there actually uh, th four years ago at uh, uh, an Espon seminar there. It was very interesting to see the experience and uh, to learn what you've been doing. Uh, the work that you've been doing in London, uh, Nikolaus, is, is very interesting. I, I'm not aware of this from before, so this uh, requires some thinking. I see that in the context of uh, what Barbara Beznek was saying. 
in my view, the, the, the questions she were raising really are the most important ones that we've heard today. Uh, if we don't address that, uh, I think the European uh, cooperation is going to be facing big problems. I would argue that the functional urban areas are, are an important part of that equation, not necessarily because they can deliver, but they uh, often balance the very polarized kind of politics that we're seeing across large parts of Europe now, uh, driven by this geography of uh, dislocation that we've, we've been talking about. There's some very important underlying discussions here. I, I, I'm not able to go into, go into all the details, but I, I feel that we're touching on something that is uh, quite new and important here. And I would certainly hope that uh, this discussion would, would conclude in that way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Austin, for your comments. And um, I would like to invite now Mr. Miklavich. Do you have any comments, uh, questions to the other speakers so far? Uh, hi, thank you for uh, your work. No particular question. I'm more looking forward to the discussion on, on the possibilities to, to shift the governance. Uh, so far, um, my, uh, my experience uh, was that the way the EU functions, and I'm looking uh, to the EU uh, because that's the only forum, the only governance level we can resolve our uh, particular challenge, um, it's been stiff, so not flexible to see the, the ground and the, the micro uh, issues um, and address them uh, effectively in a functional way. So uh, not, uh, the, the solution should be not developed away from the ground, should respond to the challenges on the ground. That's, uh, that's where, what I'm looking forward in the discussion. Thank you very much. And uh, definitely I can see it's such a shame that we don't and you don't meet in person because uh, there you would have a real uh, good uh, conversation. And we just started this discussion, the, the, the process. And of course, I hope everyone keeps in the, in the loop and contributing. The next one, uh, Mrs. Besneck, do you have a comment to make on the other one's speeches, remarks from your side? Yes, first of all, I was um, very grateful today to hear from the perspectives of cities and local communities because according to all of the research that we are doing in Slovenia and everywhere else, um, the conclusions are that <laughs> the integration policies uh, and the implementation of integration services uh, is only to be successful if it's, um, you know, implemented on the lake, local level. So, um, unfortunately, the local levels are still not uh, very much involved in the decision-making process, at least not in Slovenia, regarding migration policies. Um, although they are, you know, the core of integration. So, um, I think the... the um, only way to move forward from this uh, restrictive uh, fra fragmental uh, policies that we are facing today uh, is, you know, to engage all geographical levels into the decision-making process and into implementation processes of integrations. So not just the national level and the EU level, but cross-border regions very importantly, as in the uh, case of Malagorica, uh, and Gorizia, then municipalities, also the civil society is very important. Uh, cities and places, spaces where people actually live, where people actually work, where they integrate and where they co-create communities. So in order to do that, uh, I think we will need to further strengthen, strengthen the functional material and intellectual capacities of uh, local authorities, especially, and institutions. Um, yeah, and in order to do that, we will need to establish more, I think, formalized and more permanent channels and bodies of dialogue and exchange between all relevant stakeholders, such as this one today. So thank you very much for inviting us all. To, uh, to share. So, yeah, we, um, 
we have to see that uh, integration as all these uh, integration issues as all these other challenges that we are facing, um, we have to regard them as a two-way process or as a multi-directional process uh, that includes active engagement of everyone. So, and we shall not forget that uh, anytime we consult on policies and measures that are specific uh, to a certain group, category of people or a certain territory, we should always include the people and territories uh, that are concerned. So dialogue-based, <laughs> dialogue-based, place-based uh, policy making. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Besnek, uh, for your thoughts. And I think uh, you can see that, of course, they have already fallen on fruitful ground and there is resonance around the panel and uh, definitely also around uh, the audience. Um, well, last, last but not least, uh, Mr. Karadimitriou, do you have comments, questions on the other speakers' presentations? We have, uh, again, another little sound issue. I cannot hear you at the moment. <coughs> Can you try again? No? Can you hear me now? Coming, yes, no, thank you. It works. Ah, good, okay. Yes, yes, it was the microphone, I put it on mute. Um, so, uh, a very brief uh, comment, really. Um, I, uh, it was fascinating to see the, both the two views uh, uh, from the field on the ground. And also, of course, uh, uh, the, the more the theoretical approach, the more research-oriented approach uh, uh, coming together. And uh, really, uh, for me, it highlighted two things. One is the need to, to bridge, uh, let's say, this, uh, uh, the distance between uh, the ESPON research and uh, uh, all that work that uh, is being done on the territorial governance and the real uh, situation uh, on the ground. Uh, and uh, secondly, the, uh, for the purpose of this meeting, really, and the, the scope of this uh, um, research, this uh, assignment or this uh, consult consultation that will go on, um, the um, importance to think about uh, how useful and how successful uh, existing instruments, for example, are. Uh, I think uh, the mayor mentioned uh, EGTC, but uh, I would also mention the ITIs, uh, CLLDs, and so on. And uh, how uh, these can be perhaps enhanced or modified or uh, made to work uh, in a different way so as to satisfy uh, this um, uh, the need to, to match, let's say, the, the governance, local needs with the, the big challenges uh, ahead of us. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so you are not you are not released yet, but thank you very much to the panel. Uh, and I think you really managed, and I was curious if this is possible for this quite comprehensive and in a way maybe um, abstract topic to give everyone a flavor that's real life, it's urgency uh, to deal with the governance of new geographies. And I would like now to have a look at questions from the audience and uh, we will see who will be the one from the panel to answer these questions. Um, well, we have one question, it's uh, from Barbara, and it says, what kind of new geographies can emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic and how it has changed our ways of communicating, living, working and moving? Well, um, so um, I, d I want to prevent that someone answers this question fully. <laughs> <laughs> because we will be sitting here for the whole week or year. Um, who is interested in giving a short uh, uh, answer? Who, who feels inclined? Uh, new geographies that can emerge from the COVID-19. Who has uh, 
an idea for a short answer on this. And definitely it, is, um, it will be a topic for... Um, ah, it is a question to Barbara. <laughs> now I understand. <laughs> Barbara. Uh, just a brief, uh, brief thought that I had about it. I mean, I, I, feel, it, I feel it's like a, a little bit uh, contradictional. You know, on the one hand, we have these uh, uh, closures, you know, curfews and um, limitation of uh, um, freedom of movement and various other restrictions, right? So, uh, remember, we are talking about quarantines uh, as, uh, and social distancing as the, as the new normal, right? And on the other hand, I think uh, it really, like, in, enhanced this transition into... Um, um, the digital space, at least for me, I mean, I always thought I'm, <laughs> I'm quite uh, um, literate in the digital world and in the digital communication, uh, but uh, now I see that I wasn't, and uh, this pandemic actually forced me to somehow upgrade <laughs> technically, and not only me, I can, only, I, I can see it with my colleagues, with my family, friends, so on, I mean, uh, everyone uh, literally updated uh, um, themselves in, in this digital proficiency. So uh, there is um, a new space um, um, which is more fluent, let's say, <laughs> uh, and there is more connection uh, uh, on the other hand. So I don't know, I, it's really... I, these are the new uh, geographies that I see. Um, I, I forgot the other part of the question. Yeah, but uh, I think it's going to be, um, it, it's going to make a huge impact, especially on the way uh, how we work, uh, how we organize labor, how we organize working units, uh, how we value our working time, how we measure our working time. So, yeah, I think this will be the most uh, profound uh, challenges uh, in the future in regard of governance, besides the obvious, of course, <laughs> how to sustain our public uh, uh, health systems, social systems, and so on. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara Bethnek. I think that was already uh, a good and one of, one of the uh, very uh, visible uh, uh, also uh, new geographies and experiences you had. I think many can share this. Thank you very much for this answer. Uh, I have now another question, and it's to Peter. What pros and cons have you observed between soft and hard uh, uh, cooperation mechanisms for functional areas, for example, in France or Italy? Um, that's a very important question. Uh, well, first, the, the answer, as I said before, there is no one size fits all. And I think what works best for Marseille is not necessarily what works best for Lille, even though they have the same legislation. Uh, they will be the first to reflect on that. Um, hard, hard legal framework for uh, functional area cooperation is, uh, I think it's, it's very important because it creates stability. Uh, it gives you a long-term framework which you know is going to be there after the next election, after the election, after that, uh, and that the media will gradually build up uh, a rhetoric uh, and an understanding of uh, and the authorities that are within it, the municipalities, the cities, the uh, transport authorities, all the others, they will relate to this body, this framework, in, in, a, in, a, in a formalized way. If it's a soft cooperation, the advantage is that it's very, very much driven by motivation, and the players, the stakeholders, will have a motivation to do this work. And as long as that motivation is there, this is very good. Uh, what I didn't uh, tell you about is the, the story of our city of Oslo and our collaboration with our neighbours, which started off being kind of statutory, but then it was voluntary. And now we're facing a situation where our neighbours uh, seem to want to do something else. And the motivation is no longer there. And I think this is a reality which a number of regions face, that if it's a soft collaboration, it's very good. It's very 
driven by the, by the stakeholders until they decide that they want to do something else. <coughs> if I may, just a, a very short comment on the, the geography of COVID to, to supplement the excellent response from Barbara. What the functional urban areas are now facing across Europe, I think, is the imminent collapse of public transport. Uh, during, during the pandemic, the national governments uh, provided a lot of extra funding to keep the trains, uh, metros, buses and trams going, more or less at capacity, so people could get to their jobs, the hospitals, the shops and so on. Now the national measures have stopped, in most cases. We can see what's going to happen next. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, but when, without the national measures, uh, the, the, funding, the additional funding stops. Uh, we're seeing this in the, the Oslo region. I've read it about it in, the, in the London and Manchester areas. So there's a, there's a lot of a lot of big issues here, well. which are going to change the uh, change the geography of, of that as well. So thank you very much. Thank you for this answer uh, to Oslo. And um, now I wonder if we have another question coming from the audience. Um, as far as I could see, there was quite uh, some chats and questions around. Um, well, um, Peter, you seem to be very popular <laughs> because there is another question. It says, how functional areas can help tackle people's discontent? Um, well, this is, this, is the, this is the key question. It's what Barbara was asking. It's what Nikolaus was asking. And uh, I think what... Uh, Maybe it's, it's, it's in the process of being resolved in the case of Novgorica. This is very interesting. It's, it's by involvement. It's through involvement. Uh, the challenge with functional areas, especially functional urban areas because they're very big, is uh, public involvement is, is, is hard because there are often strategic questions on the table. Uh, the success story that we have had, that Stockholm has, that a number of other areas have, is that they involve the municipalities. So that you get the mayors from each one so taking part in the discussions. The challenge is how to get this, uh, how to organize this in a way so that ordinary people uh, feel involved in some way, and especially the vulnerable people who would not normally take part, more vulnerable people who would not normally take part in public debates. These are the really important questions. And I think there's a lot, there's a lot, a, a lot of work to be done there. Uh, participation has been high on the European agenda already. We've got this, uh, well, one of the strands of the cohesion policy is looking at that, bringing Europe closer to the people. And I think the, the work of functional urban areas is, is a very important framework for dealing with that because it is actually able to look at the tr strategic questions and not just the uh, local issues, which are a little bit easier to deal with usually. Thank you. Thank you very much for this answer. And maybe I also invite uh, Mr. Miklovic, because I guess you also have a practical experience, or how do you see, how can you tackle uh, discontent of people with uh, going in a, in, a, in a functional way? You have a lot of experience in this uh, over the yeah, last years. I can, I can merge the two questions, uh, or the answer uh, to two questions in this uh, uh, intervention. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to stick to the practical because that's, uh, that's my role. I'm a, a practitioner in, in this sense. And the COVID, for example, showed how obsolete it is to use a border, national border, as a, an instrument to solve problems. In fact, in the first wave of COVID, the government of Slovenia thought that COVID moves like uh, infantry and thought also that, the, that to resolve, because in Italy, were, they were the first ones in Europe to have uh, serious issues with, with the spread of pandemic, um, that if they, they close the border and, and build up a, an iron fence uh, on the border, that uh, they will stop COVID. What was the exact and immediate consequence, uh, uh, it was uh, affecting the daily life of people. So what was uh, produced by this measure was a, a dysfunctional uh, situation in an urban area that was already and it's still already integrated uh, in, in the daily life of people. So people couldn't go across because the only crossing was open eight kilometers south from the urban area. So they had to take a car, go down, cross the border, come back up, to work, for example, or to visit their parents, or to take care of their grandmothers, or whatsoever. So, uh, so uh, what what I can answer in, in this way is, from our perspective, this border is no longer an instrument 
to resolve the daily issues in uh, our uh, politically integrated continent. Thank you very much. So I guess you were responding uh, to the question, uh, could removing border, no, because there is another question, you somehow answered it already in a way, could removing border be a solution? Could the uh, thematic action plan consider fusions of municipalities? I don't know how far you are with fusing your mun municipalities. Uh, and, uh, uh, or territorial reforms. Uh, what we are seeing as, uh, as a way forward is definitely um, alleviating or uh, diminishing the role of the border. Of course, the ideal solution would be no border. That's the way we, we could easily uh, un, uh, organically form a region that is, uh, that is integral, because it's always been like that, but that is not so realistic at this moment uh, in Europe. So what we are asking for is a form of governance that will encompass the functional area of Gorizia, Nova Gorizia, and small suburbial uh, towns, um, so that we would be able to uh, govern, to, go, to, to run the place uh, as one single urban area. For example, COVID was a typical example, still is. In Gorizia, they have one type of measures that are decided in Rome or, or in the regional level, and we have other type of measures that are decided in Ljubljana. I'm not exposing COVID as such, but I'm exposing the ridiculous situation that we find ourselves on a daily basis because the two governances from Ljubljana or Rome are affecting our uh, area. So, so a special economic zone could be a solution, but it's not the, our case. It's not the, it, we, we are not an underdeveloped area. Uh, which is given usually this status, especially, for example, uh, southern Italy has such an area. I think that the European Commission should invent a new tool that would integrate territorial, territorially uh, area, border areas um, and give them um, a mechanism of governance. An extension of EGTC could be a way from where uh, we should look at the solution. Thank you very much uh, with, uh, for sh sharing your, your opinion and experiences on this. Uh, I have another, maybe last question from the audience. Uh, and this is a comment or maybe a possibility for you to react is to the policy makers. It says organizing citizens' engagement is key at the functional area level to help creating a sense of belonging. Is it not only to its own city? And where is the democratic legitimacy for it? How, how would you respond to this or reflect on these uh, questions? Who wants to... Sorry, I can go. Yeah, can go please. Uh, yeah, we, we're doing this, uh, but via civil society. So officially we cannot because we have two different uh, systems uh, of, of uh, governance, uh, two different countries are involved. Uh, however, in the level of civil society, we are uh, heading much faster ahead. For example, um, last year we were awarded the title of uh, European Capital of Culture, which will take place in uh, 2025. And that's a perfect example of a uh, Cross border. So Nova Gorica, together with Gorica, were awarded the title of European Capital of Culture, despite being two cities in two different uh, countries. And that, that will be an opportunity to speed up, to catalyze the processes on the, on the grassroots level. So we will, uh, with this project, enable the, the, the art groups, the cultural production, the official uh, cultural institutions, uh, uh, and so on, to perform to generate common projects and collaborate on the on the micro level and that would be uh, yet another step decisive step forward uh, in integration of the functional uh, city area and the surrounding region of Thanks. course also in the democratic terms so that's obviously a, a process of democratization through civil society thank you um 
I have a, a last question, maybe I, I give this uh, to, to Peter then, because I think it's also more to a policy uh, uh, maker. It is, uh, which narratives do you use to make understand easily by citizens and policy makers the importance to think, plan and act at functional territorial levels? Okay, thanks Alfredo, I saw that coming. <laughs> <laughs> He's a colleague of mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the most important thing to engage citizens uh, and to engage municipalities is, is, to, is to build up a narrative which relates to people's uh, ordinary daily lives and to link in with the things that they may be perceive as, as specific challenges. Transportation is very often what I would call a low-hanging fruit in, in city regions in metropolitan areas because uh, they're very heavily dependent on public transport and if the trains are delayed, the metros are overcrowded, uh, people are complaining about the prices, this is something that's easy to relate to and you can build up a narrative about cooperation can maybe lead in the, long, in the next few years to better services, better access to work, better access to the football matches, whatever. Minutes? This, is, this is the kind of thing you need to work on. But I think the, na the, the narratives that are important... And then I do a uh, last word about the coffee break and everything. Yeah. Sorry, that's another conversation? No? Sorry. Okay, uh, that, but I th uh, um, this I think is... Uh, that's the easy answer that Alfredo, I think, would, would recognise. Uh, you know, you, you talk about the, the functionality of the functional, functional area. The important question now is to have a narrative which is about inclusion, about social inclusion. Uh, and this is this is very important. This is where the the, the discussion that uh, especially Nicolaus and Barbara were introducing, uh, and how to how to how to work through that. I think cities on the whole are doing relatively better at that because they have large minority groups. They have often identifiable identifiable parts of the city which have an identity often linked to minority groups. Um, I can see that a lot of cities have done relatively well in communicating with uh, different groups of people during the COVID crisis. They were worse hit by the pandemic, but they have done a very big job in communicating and involving local citizens. I think there's a lot to build on, in fact, from the, the process of involvement dur during that. It was a crisis situation, it still is perhaps. Uh, but I think within the functional area, that is more complicated because, uh, again, we're talking about different geographies, different uh, daily life experiences, and often a kind of uh, geography of segregation, spatial segregation within the functional area. Uh, this, this is the reality in, in many uh, metropolitan areas. I think, uh, Miklavich, the, 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 the discussion in, in, in your region is more between two twin cities of a similar size, not very big cities, Whereas the functional urban areas, they're, they're often with one predominant city in the centre and, and, and a lot of smaller municipalities around the edge, which may be equal in size and population, but often have a very different structure. So this kind of asymmetry is uh, important to address. And within that context, the way of getting a dialogue, a narrative is, 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 is very important. And it's never, too, it's never too never too early to start. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry for interrupting you. Thanks a lot. And um, I think uh, we are, now we have to finish uh, the um, kind of conversation we had. And I'm, I'm really happy that it's such an interesting and engaged one. And I would now like to give the floor to Sintis uh, to conclude on our discussion uh, before I give the very last words for this session. Sintis, please. Thank you, Sabine. Um, just three short points from my side to kind of conclude this discussion. The first one is that, you know, when we're designing this TIP, uh, there was kind of a fear that this, this could be a bit too theoretical and might not reach uh, the policymakers. It would be interesting for researchers to work on this, but perhaps uh, then at the end, the, the end result uh, kind of would be, would be kind of lost and, and, and put on, on shelves. But I, I think what we saw in the presentations today uh, from, uh, from Peter and Mr. Miklavich, and also, uh, to be honest, in the chat, I think there's really um, a practical side to all of it, and there's really potential for this TIP to bridge theoretical concepts with uh, practical policy making uh, at, at a very, uh, very local level. The second point is that uh, I'm very happy that you mentioned a couple of themes which were not included in the input paper of the SPON, uh, and this is really 
nice because it, it broadens the, the, the whole concept of governance and, and, and geographies. And here I give credit to Nikos and, and Barbara um, by mentioning topics as, as inclusion, um, uh, human rights, uh, and different types of geographies, uh, which perhaps is kind of not a, a mainstream uh, talk uh, uh, among the spatial planners. And the third point is that um, I, I know that the Christmas holiday period is coming up, but as Barbara mentioned, uh, we have upgraded our digital skills. So I hope you do have time to, uh, to, to look at the Yammer platform and uh, continue this discussion after, after today. And uh, importantly, to, uh, to give us feedback and uh, continue um, shaping this TIP, because uh, today is just uh, the kickoff day. I think we have still time to, to exchange on, 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 on some uh, interesting uh, and potentially useful I ideas. So that's uh, all for me. Back to you, Sabine. Thank you very much. Um, well, all that is left to me now is uh, really to give my warm gratitude and thank you to all the speakers, to the audience for their contributions. Uh, I was really a bit uh, fearful before the session because it is such, uh, as I said, maybe abstract topic and there could be boring scientists and egocentric politicians talking about it. It was nothing at all of this. Uh, I felt that we are kind of gathering around a common a shared issue and, and we can see emerging really a, a more concrete formulated challenge, uh, the political need and we can also see in more concrete ways the scientific answer that could be given. And uh, this will really be a valuable start now for the, for the ESPON program and for the consultation process. As Sintis was uh, saying, you are hardly invited to contribute to this and uh, st stay, stay in touch and, and let keep uh, this, this good uh, ideas uh, be placed and be talked about. Um, we will now have a, a coffee break for half an hour and there will be then uh, sessions going on, which will be uh, in this room. Uh, it will be the session starting at uh, 4.30 uh, European time, which will be uh, places uh, resilient to crisis. And um, I will have the pleasure again to be with the audience and speakers of this session. And there will be then in the, in the other room, uh, there will be the session perspective for all people and places. So uh, I hope uh, you have enjoyed this way of um, talking about the thematic action plans and having interesting discussions. You got uh, appetite also to join us uh, for the second workshops around. Uh, yes, and so um, you will have a well-deserved break now. Again, thank you very much to all of you. It was a great pleasure from my side. Thank you.